Dr. Lafayette has been a civil rights movement activist, a minister, an educator, lecturer, and is an authority on the strategy of nonviolent social change. He co-founded SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He was a leader in the 1960 Nashville movement, on the 1961 Freedom Rides, the 1965 Selma movement. He directed the Alabama Voter Registration Project in 1962 and was appointed National Program Administrator for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. And he was National Coordinator for the 1968 Poor People's Campaign by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. So while all of us were having a good time in the 60s, Dr. Bernard was hard at work with his colleagues, and we're going to hear about the fruits of that labor and how difficult that work was. So all this, and there's much, much more that we'll be talking about, but what we're most proud of tonight is to reveal something not many people know. He was born in Tampa, Florida, and we are so thrilled about that. He was born, can I say your birth date, is that all right? <laughs> July 29th, 1940. Yes, so you can remember. Now, is his audio all right? Are you able to hear him? Okay, great. Uh, so, Dr. Lafayette, um, uh, recently, Metaverse, which used to be known as Facebook, issued a statement, and they said in the not-too-distant future, they expect that their platforms will allow grandchildren and great-grandchildren to walk with their grandparents through their neighborhoods and take a tour, virtually, of course. But that sounds wonderful, but I think we're way ahead of them because tonight we have you, <laughs> and you're going to take us through those neighborhoods. We're going to ask you about that, and we hope you'll inform us about what Tampa was when you were born here. So let's see if I can tickle your memory a little bit. Uh, tell me what part of Tampa you were born in. I was born in Ybor City. In fact, most of you would know my specific birthplace. I was born at 1307 uh, 8th Avenue. And that is right across the street from this huge Have a Tampa Cigar Company. That's right, that was my front yard. But my side yard was uh, Garcia Vegas, another cigar mm -hmm. factory, uh, right there in Ybor City. So uh, I was born. Between Have a Tampa and Garcia Vega. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> That's fabulous. So Tell I, us your uh, parents' names. My uh, mother's name is uh, Verdell. No, I better stop. Back up. Her name was Willie Verdell Lafayette. Okay. Okay. And uh, it, uh, middle name was Forrester. Willie Verdell Foster Lafayette. And uh, my father's name? My father's uh, original name was uh, Bernard Do uh, Lafayette. 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 French? French. Huh. My uh, grandfather was born in Cuba, and the Cubans pronounced Lafayette a little different. Uh -huh. They call it Lafaga. Lafaga. Yeah. Okay, so Lafaga. Right. I mean, he was born in Cuba. And how about your mother? My mother was born in uh, Fort Valley, Georgia. Right. And um, they grew up in uh, Tampa, Florida. Uh, Thomasville, Georgia was another place where some of my relatives were born. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were also part of Moncour. That was part of the French, okay? Uh, my original birth certificate is uh, Bernard Lafayette, 
Lafayette. My father changed it to Lafayette. Okay, it's easier to say. Yes, you know, <laughs> they even changed uh, the street uh, from Lafayette. Uh, Kennedy Boulevard? Yes. It used to be Lafayette. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm used to changing names. <laughs> okay? Oh, great. Thank yeah. you. So, um, yeah, right across the street there in Ybor City. All right, that's okay. where I was uh, born. Now, how about siblings? How siblings? How many? Uh, let's see, four girls and one boy, I believe. That's, is that correct? Besides you. Five girls? Five girls. Five girls and two boys, including you. Yeah, including right? me, yeah. Just well, I had another one, but he passed early okay. on. Oh, so there were three boys originally. All yeah, right. All right. Uh, Harold Lee was uh, four months old when he passed, and I was four years old. And I used to rock him on the front porch there in front of uh, Tampa. Tampa, uh, Tampa. Yeah, the uh -huh. cigar. And I used to rock, rock him in his bassinet, and I was only four years old myself. And they put you in charge of him? Yes. <laughs> that was uh, one of the things that happened. And I used to sing to him in his rocking chair, in his uh, bassinet. Even when he had passed on, I still rocked the, bas the bassinet oh, yeah, on the him. front porch. Missing him. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's how I recovered him uh, and sustained him by rocking the empty bassinet. I refused to accept the fact that he was gone. Well, at four years old, I can see how yes. difficult that would be. Yes. Yeah. Now, I understand your uh, grandmother, Rosalie Foster. Yes. Began the New Hope Baptist Church. Tell us a little bit about her. Well, uh, the pastor of St. John Baptist Church, was from, I think it's, uh, was it, uh, what was his name? Washington. Okay. J.G. Washington, and he married, his wife died, he married a young girl, and many of the members of the congregation, uh, older women, didn't like that. Because oh. <laughs> they had spent a lot of money buying fancy clothes and fancy hats, you know, and it was, uh, we used to have to get up and walk around to put our money on the table, you know, for collection. And these women used to just parade, because one of them had planned to marry him, you know? Uh, so that was their time and, to shine, yeah. operatory time. And he married this young shine. girl, Gladys Washington, and uh, they put him out. Oh. <laughs> so my grandmother um, helped to organize uh, the New Hope, because that was not New Hope. Right, that they I had. got it, yeah. So uh, he, uh, my grandmother, and this was, I learned so much. I have to put this in since you mentioned Please. it. I learned a lot growing up from people that I uh, hung out with, you know? So this is just one quick lesson, and I can go back to some earlier things as well. My grandmother organized a uh, prayer meeting uh, uh, and Bible study groups in folks' homes. She uh, just sort of brought folks together and they read the Bible and they had prayer. And, they, and then the people who were there in that particular meeting at their house, they went out and, and, and started one in their house. So you had all of these little circles, they call them, prayer circles in Bible study. And, they, and, and as a result of that, she then pulled all of them together, and that formed New Hope Baptist Church. Wow, amazing. She was so smart. She was finished she the third grade. Finished the third grade. My grandmother finished the third grade. Very smart. And yes, absolutely. I don't know. She only had one textbook, and that was uh, Blue Bag Webster. That was their, 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 their textbook. Blue? Blue Bag Webster. I haven't heard it of It was that. a dictionary. Oh, the Webster Dictionary. That was her, book, her school book. That's what the school yes. textbook was. All right. When she was in the third grade. So 
while we're talking about schools, let's talk about your school. So you started elementary school at Book D, right? Helping Hand Day Nursery. Of course, yes. Yes, that was the way I started. Then I went to Miss Brown. That was uh, not too far from here, down the street there. It was uh, Brown's uh, preschool. So that was the original yeah, homeschooling, a, right? Yep, that's right. right. And she used to be very strict in terms of your spelling. And if you uh, had to spell a word and you missed a letter or something like that, she had a ruler, and it was not to measure anything else <laughs> except the sound of your voice, okay? That's what they measured with their ruler when they crack you on your, your hands. <laughs> the sound of your scream. <laughs> right. And then uh, the boys uh, used to be behave in a way, and she used to put them under her desk. Wow. Yeah. And... Um, so I observed how she was handling the situation, and I just sort of cooperated with it. Very, and I very made sure smart. I, very smart. Yeah, my spelling was very good. <laughs> yeah. So then did you go to Booker T from there? I uh, no, from T. there I went to Meacham. Oh, Meacham, okay. Yay. All Meacham right. Elementary School, Picks yes. my notes here. All right, I remember Meacham, Meacham so well. Yeah. And then uh, I went from Meacham to uh, Booker T. Washington. There you go. That was okay. a middle school. At, that was middle school. Yeah. Okay. Booker T. Washington was Fixing middle school. My notes. And then Middleton was the uh, senior high school. Senior high school. You had a choice between Blake and Milton. If you lived near West Tampa, you went to Blake. Oh, there's the yellow Don jackets Thompson. in the audience. Yeah, that's what it was. Because Mr. Blake was. Uh, the principal of my middle school, and they named the school after him, a black man, Blake. Okay, he was my uh, superintendent, not my uh, principal, and they named him, they named the school Blake when it was over in St. Pete, yeah. So uh, I finished Milton, I was the editor of my school newspaper, okay, and uh, uh, our school won first place, it's among the black schools, in the state of Florida in 1958. Where and I was the paper. editor of the newspaper. Top newspaper in the top state of Top newspaper in the state of Florida. And when you uh, were in that, in that position and won that award, it meant you got a four-year scholarship at Florida A&M in journalism. Okay. So he was the editor yes. and was offered the four-year scholarship at Florida A&M. And then what happened, Bernard? Well, did you go? I did go up to uh, Florida A&M to uh, visit, to observe. But my grandmother told me that I was not going into journalism. Oh, she did. Yeah. I enjoyed journalism, but my grandmother said, no boy, you're going to be a preacher. <laughs> well, when I was little, they used to sit me, uh, I had a chair next to the pulpit, okay? The lectern, a little chair, and they used to sit me there because they always said that I was going to be a preacher. So they sent me as a little boy. I used to perform the Tom Thumb Weddings. That was a little play they used to have with the children oh. marrying, and you had a bride and everything else. I always, so I was marrying So you were the folks. efficient yeah. at these Tom Thumb Weddings. Yeah, I was a, <laughs> yeah, all the way through. So uh, uh, she said, uh, you are going to be a preacher, and uh, I saw the mark in your forehead. I used to stay in the mirror looking for this mark. <laughs> the only mark I saw was where I had the chicken pox. <laughs> okay? My grandmother found uh, 
a church and she uh, got the minister to recommend me to go to uh, American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville. Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, we didn't know anybody in Nashville. So I had to follow what my grandmother said. So she said I was going to be a preacher, so I was going to be a preacher. Now, before we leave the neighborhood, there is something I forgot to ask you about. And that is, while you were in school, you had a little job. You worked. Yes. Where did you work? I worked many places. I used to uh, be a paper boy for uh, Tampa, was it Tampa what? Tampa Tribune, I guess. The other one. Times. Tampa Daily Times. I used to deliver papers, okay? But at an earlier age, I used to get up in the morning. I was right in Ybor City. I used to get up in the morning at 5.30. And I would jump out of my window, okay, out of bed, because my bed had a, a window over it. And I would jump right out, okay? And I used to go over on 7th Avenue, and I used to buy coffee from uh, Las Novenadas. Yeah. And uh, what I would do is, because see, I could smell the coffee being brewed, okay? And uh, the, 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 rather the coffee beans, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. And also the Cuban bread, because the bread company was right there. And I used to sleep with my window open, so I could smell all of these things. So I used to wake up. So I used to go over and, and get coffee at Las Novenadas, and I used to uh, uh, be the wholesaler. And I would buy the coffee, and then I would take it over on 7th Avenue, right down there, and uh, for the merchants who were just opening up. They hadn't opened their stores yet. That's where I had my first sit-in at Las Novenadas. Wow because I used to wait for them to fix the coffee, and there was a huge mirror there, and we used to just be talking, 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 and then I'd put my uh, side, <laughs> I won't call it what it is, uh, up against the stool, and then gradually I slid on top of the stool. <laughs> and I was, you know, looking like this. The fellow fixing the coffee, he saw me through the mirror, because his back was turned to me and he was fixing the coffee. And he looked out the uh, window there to make sure nobody was watching me. And I kept talking to him. I never stopped. That's important. When you're trying to reach people with your tongue, don't stop. <laughs> talk, talk, talk. So what happened is that that's when I had my first sit-in. Because I was sitting there on that stool. Where you weren't supposed to be. I didn't even know anything about no uh, sit, you know, <laughs> sit-ins and all that, but I wanted to sit on that stool because I knew that that was not for black folks, and so I was a, a I was a merchant, okay. And so, is that when they nickname you Mr. Coffee? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I used to be the one that uh, did the coffee. Yeah. So what happened is I would ten cent for the coffee, I would sell it to the merchants. And then ten cent for me, okay. Sounds fair. And I had a carnation, uh, you know, cardboard a tray that I used, and I used to sell it. Now the other thing that happened is that when I was going to uh, Meacham Elementary School, there were three students uh, who were classmates who didn't have lunch money. So I used to buy their lunch for them, three of them. With your coffee earnings. It wasn't with 10 cents for lunch. <laughs> but, you know, I'd take at three thirty cents and buy lunch for them every day. I Otherwise, heard, they wouldn't I heard you like to buy something else with that money that you earned. Did you like to buy bollitos? Bollitos, <laughs> yes. <laughs> And devil crabs. <laughs> uh, and tell, bollitos are uh, black-eyed pea hush puppies. 
made out of black eyed peas. Oh, it is so Very good. Cuban dish, mm -hmm. very typical of Ybor City. Absolutely. His mouth is watering right now, I can see it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. But you like that. I, um, I grew up always thinking about, and I learned this from my family, parents and everybody, that the purpose for you being born and, and living was to uh, be of service and help to others. That's what your purpose, okay? Being did, there. Did you have any, since we're both educators, I've got to ask you, did you have any teachers that influenced you through high school and through middle school? Mr. Booker. Mr. Booker. Mr. Booker was one of those who used to pull down the curtains and lock the door and said, don't repeat anything I say right now. And he used to give us a black history lesson. Well, how long ago? Yeah. And, and, and so therefore we learned, you know, in our classrooms, okay? And uh, Mr. James Lovett was also a person. Now the real person was Miss Frankie Berry. Well, that sounds like a lot of people feel that way about Miss Frankie Berry. The only time that I didn't, only day of the week that I didn't have the opportunity to interact with Mrs. Berry was on Saturdays, because there was no school. She was my English teacher. So I had her for five days, from what? Monday to Friday. And then guess what? She was my Sunday school teacher. Of course. <laughs> so it was Miss Barry. Yeah, yeah. Taught me, you know, English, but also uh, the scriptures and that sort of thing. Yeah. She was. Did you ever have a chance to tell her how much she meant to you and how much? Yes, I did. I came back, did for you. and I did get a chance to I'm let so her know. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. That's the real paycheck for teachers, don't you think? Yeah. When students really, come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she made a difference. All right, I interrupted you, so let's go back to the fact that you decided not to go to Florida A&M, and you headed to Nashville. Yes, and the church sent me off to Nashville. It was a work scholarship. I had a full scholarship to Florida A&M. I had a work scholarship to uh, American, Baptist. American Baptist College. And American Baptist College was uh, funded by both Southern Baptists and National Baptists. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the Southern Baptists didn't want all those uh, black Baptists to be going up north, you know, and uh, getting involved with the North, Northern Baptist Convention because they were more, you know, liberal type. And so the Southern Baptists, they got together and got this land and uh, bought it. And the National Baptists built the buildings. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and they, they furnished the uh, place and stuff like that. But it was jointly owned by the National Baptists and Southern Baptists, black and white. How more integrated could you get? Yeah, we even had white and teachers. It was 1958, right? I had white teachers. Yeah, that's right. right. White professors. At, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you had some interesting roommates and friends that you made there. Yes, I went to American Baptist. Uh, uh, the, the our church, say uh, New Hope. The, the members got together to, to give me a send-off, you know, the students going to college. And guess what they gave me? <laughs> Sardines, <laughs> all kind of canned goods, and food and stuff like that. That's what I had in my suitcase. I said, oh my goodness, okay. So I got up there, and guess what happened? I arrived at school two weeks early because see, Florida A&M started two weeks ago, and I got the time mixed up in terms of when the school started, and ended up there in, in uh, Nashville, 
And it's a good thing that I had all that food. It's the truth. <laughs> Somebody knew what they were doing. Isn't that something? Yeah, that was a miracle. So I got a job. So I was janitor of the second floor, and I was out there cutting grass and everything. And because I was from Florida, people thought that I knew about planting flowers and, <laughs> and planting, yeah, and vegetables and stuff like that. They used to hire me. I didn't know anything about that. <laughs> but I learned real fast, you know, how to uh, do that yeah. kind of thing. So no problem. So uh, I got there, and uh, I got the room uh, at the dormitory. Uh, that had uh, two two bedrooms, you know, together. And when John Lewis came, uh, he became my roommate because it was the largest, uh, <laughs> you know, room on campus. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of uh, amenities and stuff like that, yeah. And, uh, of course, I uh, was had some experience working in the library at the Milton, high school, and they turned around and made me the assistant librarian. Wow. Because I had the skills, okay? <laughs> and guess what happened? The librarian became an expectant mother and had difficulties and had to leave school. And who do you think was a librarian? Of course. I used to sleep in the library. You know, because, you know, you did a lot of work. So I had a lot of studying to do and stuff like that. So I did go and I sometimes slept in the library. And then I was down to the second floor, and I volunteered to wash dishes in the uh, cafeteria. You know why? Because I uh, had uh, the opportunity to eat some collard greens, <laughs> and pot liquor. Yeah, pot liquor. I got some in my refrigerator now. So what was, yeah. it, what was it like rooming with John Lewis? He was a year ahead of me in school. So who do you think tutored me? <laughs> I didn't have to buy any books. Because <laughs> he had books from the previous year, right? Perfect. Okay. Perfect arrangement. Yeah. So that was great. And then great. he started inviting you to come Try along to with him. get me to go to some workshops. Some workshop? Man, I got all the work I can handle right now. <laughs> I didn't know what no workshop was. So he kept talking, so I went for him to close his mouth. <laughs> I want to be able to say, all right, I did it. I went, OK. I got there, and Jim Lawson, Jr., was given these nonviolent workshops. And let me tell you this, that brought it all together. Because see here, I was interested in bringing about social change. Because when I was uh, in, 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 uh, a little boy uh, in Ybor City, the streetcar used to run right in front of our street. The cable car, you call it, yes. you know. And what happened was I used to run with my grandmother. They say I was always on her dress tail, everywhere she went. And that was true. I was a little boy, and I know all about older women. You got an expert on older women. <laughs> I'm talking about on her dress tail, mm. everywhere she went. And she was smart as she could be. You know what she used to do? I don't try this. She used to go and she had an issue or something she was dealing with. She owned her own house, you know, a big two-story house, and rented out rooms and stuff like that. And she was into a business. She went and she used to talk to the lawyers, one at a, five lawyers in one day. So what she would do is take what she learned from one lawyer and go to another lawyer and ask the questions and get the answers to that one and then go back. She became an expert on a particular issue in one day. Because wow. she talked to five different lawyers. You're right. She and was I was right smart. with her, okay? She, she was very smart. Yeah. yeah. So what happened is that we were going uh, to uh, she would catch a trolley cane. Now, in those days, the trolley cars was segregated. 
blacks had to go and put their money in the front of the uh, trolley car, okay? And then you had to get off the front after you seat after you paid, walk alongside the what, trolley car, and, and then you would go on the uh, back, uh, back door. Back door. Uh -huh. You step up on those steps, and they had a rubberized curtain. So there's no question about you getting up there with the white folks. Rubberized curtain, and the blacks would sit in the back. Okay? Now, what I used to do as a little boy, uh, we used to go up there and put the money in, but then I would run into the back and jump on the steps. So the conductor, you know, the door couldn't close if you were standing on the steps. Because sometimes the, the conductor would take your money and while you were walking along the side, they would close the doors and take off. And that happened to your grandmother? It happened to us. It happened to my grandmother. She was running, walking fast. She had high heel shoes on, you know, a hat, you know, she was all dressed up. And she, her heel got caught in the cracks around the track, and she fell, boom, right in the middle of the street. And my grandmother weighed 500 pounds. Oh, I don't think so, not 500. Yeah, but she, she was, was uh, heavy. Okay, yeah, we get was, it. She was solid, solid <laughs> woman, yeah. Oh, did I say that right? No. And well, my great-grandmother weighed five. My grandmother weighed three. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, she couldn't, I tried to, I jumped off and tried to pull her up, you know, no, and we're in the middle of the street because cars coming, you know, with the truck. And he took off. He took off. Left you there. And so I said to myself, and the other thing is, if you remember, at age 12, there's an experience that you had that you would never forget, age 12. I know what mine was. I said to myself, when I get grown, I'm going to do something about this. That was the movement for me. Yep. I started moving as a man, OK? From that point on, that was my goal. So back to Jim Lawson now, those when I got to this workshop with Jim Lawson, that put it all together. It's the social action, you know, orientation and social change along with theology. And it was inseparable, because there was Martin Luther King talking about nonviolence, talking about putting love into action in order to bring about equality and respect for all people. That's what the theology meant for me, okay? And Jim Lawson was the one that, okay? So by this time, Dr. King had already formed the SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Yes. Right? By yes. this time that you were taking these um, yes. trainings and seminars. In fact, it was, people need to know this, it was actually Martin Luther King who invited Jim Lawson to come south. So Jim Lawson decided to come to Nashville, and he went to Vanderbilt Divinity School, okay? Because that was the only part of Vanderbilt that was desegregated, the Divinity School. Can you imagine that? Yeah, you could go there, but you couldn't go to the restrooms, <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> they was... <laughs> They didn't have any for black folks in those days. So you know. tell us about the sit-ins uh, that sit -ins? started in 1960. Okay. Now what happened is we went and we got trained in nonviolence. And that's what uh, is so significant. In fact, that's what I do today. Okay? All over the world. So uh, we started experimenting with nonviolence. So our first uh, demonstrations down at the lunch counters in Nashville was to experiment. And what we did was uh, we uh, took the experience that we got as a result of sitting in. We didn't get arrested. 
because when the police came and said we had to go, we left. We came back, and what we did was what you call simulation. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we practiced what we had experienced down there to get us, us prepared for it. I didn't learn to Harvard University that the whole process there was about conditioning yourself because you had to already think and be prepared how you were going to respond to the violent behavior right. psychologically. Because right. you can't just physically say, okay, go ahead and hit me. Okay, no, you had to be prepared. So they started in Greensboro, but they asked us to uh, give them support because Jim Lawson knew the chaplain down there. And he was the one that asked us, could y'all give us some support? You know what we did? We had a march. We didn't go sit in and demonstrate. We came back from the march and said, well, why are we marching? We need to go on and sit in, <laughs> okay? So that's when we start our sit-in movement. But guess what, the short of it is this. Not only did we desegregate the lunch counters, we desegregated the bus station, because they had lunch counters. All right. And you can't desegregate lunch counters in a bus station and desegregate the restroom, because they go together, you know? And how did that go? It didn't go so easily, did it? No, uh, in fact, to my dismay, and I, was, I can almost feel the emotions now, that once they desegregated the lunch counters, okay, uh, they agreed to do that. The, um, the, the manager, and it's hard to believe now, because it's hard for me to believe it, but it was true, when older black women went to catch the bus, they made them go around the alley, okay, behind the bus station and go to the uh, kitchen and they would be able to eat, okay, on a, uh, uh, a, a, a table, mm -hmm. a porcelain table. Older black women who were you know, carrying little bags and stuff like that. So I say, no, they, the, the, they, they're supposed to desegregate these. No. I went up there and to see the manager, because we spent a lot of time out of school demonstrating and going to jail and everything. We missed a lot of classes. I was thinking, I was thinking about that. Yeah, but we uh, studied. So what I, I went down to the manager of the bus station, and I said to him, I understand that uh, you uh, are, are sending older black women around through the alley to eat, and they, no, no. Uh, I told my uh, waitress to serve everybody. How are you going to tell your waitress to serve everybody? When uh, I said, listen, do you see that fellow sitting over there? This was a white fella sitting on the stools. I said, he's the one that told us what you were doing. And he said, oh, I got, uh, uh, you know, I said, listen, man, we don't have time to be playing around. Right. I mean, I only take leadership when it's necessary, okay? That's why a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people don't know about me, and that's purposeful, you know, that's what I do. I said, listen, we don't, we don't have time for you to be lying to us and carrying on, okay? And he was stunned that this white boy had told what happened. Because sure. he didn't think they were white people were with us, you know? So I said, uh, now, we, I went back, I got my books, and I got John Lewis and Diane Nash and Marion Barry and a couple others, and we went and we had an all-night sit-in we had our books with us and stuff like that, so we wouldn't be totally uh, unavailable. Because we didn't know how long we were going to stay. Right. Whether we were going to get beaten up or whether they are going to put us in jail, you just don't know. But you have to be prepared. Of course. And did they put you in right. jail? Well, they got me. 
what happened is that they, we, they, the, the manager locked the doors, turned out the lights, and this is something I never did understand. He put tape on the refrigerator. <laughs> like we gonna cook, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. We stayed in that bus station all night long. And that was you and John Lewis, Lewis Diane Mar Nash, Marion Barry, Marion Barry, and uh, Jim Bevel. Oh, Jim Bevel. And so what happened is 5:30. I got up and I said, "Okay, I'm uh, need to make a phone call." And the phone booth was outside there in the parking lot, you know. So I went out to the bus station. They let me out and locked the door behind me because they wanted people to get out. So I went out there and I got in the folding booth and uh, started making a phone call. And you know, the uh, phone booth was in the dormitory in those days. We didn't have cell phones. So what happened is that the phone kept ringing, 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 ringing. And what happened is uh, these cab drivers who used to, you know, used to, they, they, they were used to getting coffee and waiting for their ride to come and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. And, and they were making fingers at us all night long. You know, we ain't paying attention to them. So they came and kicked the door open where I was making a phone call, pulled me out, put a headlock on me, and threw me out of there and started beating me. They knocked me down in the, in the, on, the, on the concrete floor. And beat you. Yeah. I slowly got back up because they were knocking me down, so I didn't d diminish their, you know, knocking me down so many times. So I got up slowly. slowly. Yeah, and I turned around and looked at them. Now that's one thing we're trained to do in nonviolence is look in the eyes of people and show them what you want them to see, okay? And you keep searching for what you want to see out of them. But you have to reflect that through your own eyes and your own behavior. In other words, you're saying, act like me, okay? So you have to, you have to demonstrate how you want them to act. And every time they knocked me down, I didn't jump up now. I just slowly got back up, turned around and looked at them. One guy, when I was down, kicked me in the face. Yeah, so I slowly wiped the shoe print off my face and then looked at them. And uh, they were expecting me to hit back or try to do something or to run. Because that's what one of them said, catch him, catch him, catch him. How are you going to catch somebody who's not running? <laughs> I stood there and looked at them. And uh, they were out of breath because they were emotionally, you know, right. distraught. Right. You know what to do. So, uh, what'd you say to them? The police came over. They were watching the whole time. So this policeman came over and got me, okay, and put handcuffs on me. And started, and the young policeman was walking with him. He said, well, what are we gonna charge him with? And the old policeman said, what do you mean what are we gonna charge him with? Fighting. So we kept walking a few more steps. And then the uh, young p policeman said, uh, who are we gonna say he was fighting with? <laughs> so the older policeman said, go get one of them. So the guy who had kicked me in the face and was then taken over, uh, they got him. And they put handcuffs on him. And they uh, had put me in the paddy wagon and then they threw him in on top of me. And he went up against the wall, he was scared. I said, and I told him this. I said, I'm the same on the inside as I am on the outside. So you're fine with me. But he didn't trust that because he's the one that kicked me. So he, we went on down, we got arrested. And uh, of course they came down and bailed me out and we put up the bail for him. Look at that. Yeah. So you always show people what, how you want them to act. There you go. That's what nonviolence yeah. was all about. Now tell so, us about SNCC. Yeah. 
Well, because um, it was right after that, wasn't it? That you formed SNCC. Um, they uh, formed SNCC. Southern Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Student. Student. Sorry, student. Yeah. Nonviolent Coordinating. Martin Luther Committee. King sent Ella Baker out, and Ella Baker was a black woman who was working with Martin Luther King to organize a, a youth group to study nonviolence. So she went to uh, the Shaw University, yeah, and uh, that was her alma mater. So she uh, formed the group, and we went down, and uh, John Lewis, Diane Nash, Jim Bevel, Marion Barry, and uh, they uh, we formed SNCC, okay, and the. Uh, what was your Ella, purpose? Now, your I want to say this Ella yeah. Baker, Ella Baker, but also Connie Curry. She was a white woman who helped work with Ella Baker. So the two of them were the advisors for SNCC. Now, they got uh, Marion Barry to be the chairman of SNCC, and he was a graduate student, okay, at Tennessee State. And he was, uh, he ended up being the mayor of in Washington, D.C. and all that, okay? But anyway, he uh, was there. And so rather than being an affiliate of SCLC, it became an independent organization of students because it was sponsored, the students were sponsored by CORE, NAACP, and other groups. So it wasn't, uh, so we represented a lot of different organizations. And shortly after it was formed, uh, then the Freedom Rides began. Yes, when well, we had the uh, sit-ins, and we desegregated the movie theaters in Nashville in 1960. We desegregated the lunch counters, okay, of the department stores, and the uh, bus station was desegregated, okay. All using the nonviolent non strategies that you had been taught. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, when the Freedom Rise was, uh, well, that, that, when we went home for the holidays in 1960, for the Christmas holidays, John Lewis and I desegregated the buses. Barack Obama mentions that in, John, in the eulogy he did for John Lewis. That's who he's talking about, me and John Lewis. Because what happened was, how are you gonna have a desegregated bus station and then you're gonna go out and get on a segregated bus. Right. That didn't, didn't make sense. We didn't feel comfortable doing that. So we desegregated the bus. And when I sat behind the bus driver, John Lewis sat on the other side, you know, in the front seat. This was Christmas holiday of 1960, before the Freedom Ride started. Mm -hmm. And the bus driver said, get up and get your black so-and-so back then. Uh, well, he didn't know he was talking to. So uh, we didn't move. So he jumped off the bus to go in the bus station to get some you know, help. Because bus drivers were responsible for enforcing the segregation laws. Right. Couldn't put a policeman on every bus. So the bus driver was the one, you know. So he went back and he came back because he didn't get any help, any support. And uh, he ran, he had his, you know, how those big buses are, and the, the seats slide back and forth, you know, on those rails. And he, I was behind him, and he rammed his uh, rail. Whew. I had my suitcase there, and he punched a hole in my suitcase. It would have been a hole in my leg if my suitcase wasn't there, okay? So uh, I was very fortunate. I didn't, didn't break my legs, uh, but I stayed there and sat there. Well, the short story is that we went on down to Troy, Alabama. That's where uh, John Lewis got off. Bus station, it was late at night, no lights. It was a gas station. And I remember when John Lewis uh, got off the bus, his ride was not there. So he had to get off in the dark, deep dark. And when I, he looked at me and I turned, he turned around, looked at me as he was getting off, and I said, bye. 
And I was saying goodbye because I didn't know uh, whether I would see him again, you know? We were, we were roommates, okay? And then when the bus pulled off, I thought about the fact that I was on that bus with that bus driver by myself. <laughs> so uh, when I said goodbye, I was also saying goodbye to myself. Yeah. Oh, but we got on down. Made it all right. We made it down to Tallahassee, Florida, and that's when they changed buses. Uh, so um, I went on to Tampa from there. So uh, that was a friend. So on the Freedom Rides, yeah. uh, the, um, uh, when CORE started the Freedom Rides, and... Um, that was May of 61. Yeah. Oh, we applied to go on that Freedom Ride, because John Lewis and I, you know, already had a Freedom Ride. So uh, those of us from Nashville decided that we were, I was going to apply, and I did. But I was not, um, what, um, 21 yet. I was only 20. John Lewis was 21 in February. I wouldn't be 21 until July. So John Lewis applied, I applied, but then they told me I had to have parental permission. You didn't get it, did you? Well, I sent off for the information to, here in Tampa <laughs> to my father, okay, Bernard Lafayette, and I didn't hear anything. <laughs> so my time was running out because you had to get your application in and get all that kind of stuff, you know, approved. So, because uh, you had that parental permission, so I called my daddy, and I said, uh, Daddy, yeah? Did you, did you get that letter I sent you, the, that form, that information? He said, uh, yes, I, I did get it. Oh, <laughs> so glad you got it, because I sent a special delivery, you know, I mean, I was hoping that you would get it in time. Yeah, I said, uh, could you uh, sign it and send it back right away, you know? Because I was thinking he might have thought it was related to college, you know, application uh, for, for financial aid or something like that, whatever. Just sign it. Because they have a thick, you know, all that reading you got to do sometimes. Yeah. You just sign and move on. So he said, do you think I didn't read it? <laughs> but he finished the seventh grade, right? Yeah. So uh, I said, uh, yeah, uh, uh, could you just sign it and send it back, special delivery? It was a long pause. He said, do you think I'm going to sign your death warrant? That was his interpretation of going on the freedom rides, you know, confronting that kind of thing. But you kept trying, and you went on two more. Well, uh, when the core uh, freedom rides got ran into a, a you know an array of violence, you know down in Birmingham, they pulled them off there and beat them up. Jim Peck, you know, was one of them that got his head all bashed in and everything. And then they in Anniston, Alabama, they burned the bus threw a Molotov cocktail through the back window and set the bus on fire. So they halted the Freedom Rides. And some people, you know, flew on by plane to New Orleans, which was the destination, and they kind of culminated that part of the Freedom Rides. But those of us in Nashville say, no, we can't let violence have the last word on us. So we asked CORE if we could continue the Freedom Rides. And they gave us permission. So that's why it was uh, possible then for John Lewis, because uh, he was on the original. He had all the information and the books and the contact information, phone numbers and everything. So we were getting ready to go. Um, so not to diminish anything that happens in these next few years, suffice it to say that all of you kept on keeping on and you met with all kinds of 
resistance. Um, you were arrested several times, and you and John Lewis, I read somewhere, even once you were in jail together, and you started a new movement while you were in jail. I don't know how you did that. So um, this kept on going, and you kept, I, I'm not sure if you can put your finger on what made you be so determined and so dedicated to this, to continue to overcome the abuse, the um, violence, and everything that you met with, even before Selma, you met with so much. But something kept making you drive on forward. Do you know what that is? Can you describe what that is? Was it the spirit of your comrades that were all together because y'all were pretty tight. Seeing my grandmother on the middle of the street. Stayed with you. Yeah. That stayed with you. Yeah. To this day. That's right. I can see it. That's the thing mm -hmm. that I will never forget. Yeah. Say, when I get grown. Now, the other thing that motivated me, besides my grandmother, when I got grown, and was involved in so much, was Martin Luther King. I, uh, as in my book, you could see where after the Freedom Rides, we stayed in jail. And what happened is that when we got to, uh, say, um, on the way from Birmingham to uh, Montgomery, for example, because we picked up the march where, I mean, the, the Freedom Rides where they got stopped in Birmingham. So we uh, decided we would continue. So we divided up into two groups. John Lewis took the first group. I took the second group because we wanted to make sure we had some people who could continue the freedom rides no matter what happened to the first group. Then we set up a full-time office in Nashville and started training people who were coming down. They came through Nashville to be trained to get on the freedom rides. So we created a movement. So There's a difference between a protest and creating a movement, okay? And that's what we did. So uh, John Lewis took the first group. They got arrested down there, Bull Connor, and they got put in jail. And uh, you know what they were charged with? Protective custody. In other words, they put them in jail. To keep them safe. Yes. <laughs> and made sure they were in jail so they wouldn't get arrested. OK? And so that's like uh, putting the banker in jail so he wouldn't get robbed. Anybody going to break in jail to rob the banker? OK. So uh, protective custody. But then they told me he was going to take him back to Nashville. And instead of taking him back to Nashville, he took the uh, car loads and uh, police sheriff cars of the Freedom Riders and dumped them out in the midnight on the uh, state line between uh, Alabama and uh, Tennessee. Put them out, luggage and everything. Dr. Lafayette, this time has flown by so fast, and I know these nice people have been very patient and want to ask you some questions. So um, quickly tell us what you are doing right now. As a result of Martin Luther King's last words to me, in Memphis, Tennessee, I was there with him, okay? And uh, when he got shot, all of us staff people went up to uh, Memphis. That was Jesse Jackson and Jose Williams and all our staff people, okay? Um, and Martin Luther King was actually scheduled to go to uh, Washington, D.C. to do a press conference on the Poor People's Campaign. Right. 
But since he had to do the march over again because it got broken out with violence when he was walking with the sanitation workers, uh, he decided to do that march over again. So he sent me to uh, Washington, D.C. That's that picture you see on the front of my book. That, that's uh, where he was uh, at a press conference and he was announcing that I was going to be the administrator over his program staff. National Program Administrator was my title. Do you know what that meant? <laughs> I was going to supervise Jose Williams, <laughs> Jesse Jackson, <laughs> Lerone <laughs> Bennett, <laughs> right? <laughs> Dorothy <laughs> Cotton. <laughs> okay. The, he, and that's why I was looking at him, because some of those people, they're much older than I was. You know, I went to the military and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I was looking at him. But Martin Luther King saw something in me that I did not see in myself. Hmm. But the last words I had with him was when we went to Memphis, he was sending me off to make another press conference by myself to announce the headquarters for the Poor People's Campaign in D.C., 14th and U. And uh, so when he spoke at the church that night, he was so excited and he came back, we couldn't finish the press conference statement. So uh, we waited till the next morning. So uh, that morning uh, of the April 4th, I finished the press conference, press statement for Martin Luther King, and then he proved it, and we, I went to walk out the door, and Martin Luther King said, now wait a minute, hold it. He said, um, you go ahead and get that poor people's campaign started, and I'll be along later. Okay. Then when I put my hand on the doorknob, he said, now Lafayette, he called me Lafayette because there was another Bernard Lee on the staff, Bernard Lee. So he always called me by my last name, Lafayette. He said, now, the next movement we're going to have is to institutionalize and internationalize nonviolence. OK. When he got shot, killed. I had to uh, think about institutionalizing nonviolence and internationalizing nonviolence because he was not here to do it. Because that was his intention. Yes. So I went back to school. My mother was very happy I went back to school. And I finished school. In fact, I finished the school at American Baptist College, which I ended up being president of the college in order to get it accredited. But I went to Fisk University, and then I went to Boston University Law School because I was trying to prepare myself for what Martin Luther King wanted to do, internationalize and institutionalize nonviolence. So what I have done with my life is tried to uh, fulfill Martin Luther King's uh, next movement that he wanted to do. So uh, I went to... Uh, Harvard University, got a master's and a doctorate. Okay, I met my wife, Kate Lafayette, up there, and she helped me, okay. <laughs> she was in early childhood development. She's organized the Coretta Scott King Daycare Center there in the mall for the Poor People's Campaign. And uh, so, so to summarize where we started and where mm -hmm. we are right now. We started between Have a Tampa and which other one? Which other cigar factory? Garcia Vega. Garcia we Vega. Have a Tampa, Garcia Vega. And we went through Selma, Montgomery, Birmingham to Harvard. <laughs> this brilliant man, graduate of Harvard. <laughs>